My name is Richard Lee Haynes Jr., but I'm known as Cody Haynes. I've been missing since September 12, 2004. I didn't ask for this life, and I didn't deserve it. My sisters and I suffered physical and mental abuse at the hands of our father and stepmother. Before I disappeared, I was beaten for not doing the dishes and failing to say pasta correctly. My sisters could hear me being beaten, but couldn't do anything to help me without being beaten themselves. My sister heard a loud thud, and she could no longer hear my cries. A couple hours after, my father decided to take a trip at 2 a.m. to, quote, look for car parts in a town of only 1,100 people. He didn't come home for 14 hours. My stepmother, Marla J. Harding, was home and never checked on me once. My sisters woke to a chair in the hallway with a note telling them to stay away from the room I was supposedly in. My dad came home from his mysterious trip and said I was gone. Still, they waited until 6 p.m. to call 911 and then told police I ran away. I am asking the world to be my voice. Hey everyone, John Lorden. Uh, that was taken from a Facebook page called Justice for R. Cody Haynes. There's a link to it down below if you want to check it out for yourselves. This is obviously going to be a very tough episode. I've had many of you out there tell me that I really need to cover this case. And after looking into it, I now understand why there were so many of you asking me to do that. So thank you for that. Right now, I can tell you guys, it's time that we turn on the searchlight for Cody. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm your host, John Lord, and thank you so much for joining me today. And I just want to give everyone a fair warning. We're talking about very tough situations here. We're talking about children potentially being abused in these situations. Um, so I'm going to tread as cautiously as I can. And I just ask that you guys please be respectful in the comments below around this case. It's a very touchy topic for a lot of people, and I don't want anyone to be inadvertently hurt in any way by uh, this video or any of the comments around it. So please join me in trying to make sure that we all discuss this case as respectfully as possible. Let's start with a uh, understanding of where this is taking place. This is from Wikipedia, and we are learning about Ketitis or Ketitis Washington. Katitis is a city in Katitis County, Washington, United States. The population was 1,381 at the 2010 census. And of course, in the letter that was posted on the Facebook page, we can understand that at the time that Cody went missing, uh, it was about 1,100 people. And here on the right, you can see a map of Washington and uh, Katitis is basically square in the center of the state. Let's continue with the NamUs profile and see what we can learn about this case. Missing person, Richard Lee Haynes, male, white, Caucasian, date of last contact, September 12th, 2004. There's some question in this case uh, in terms of the date. Uh, we're going to bump into some different things. I'm really not sure if the last time anyone saw him was on the evening of the 11th or possibly after midnight, just after midnight on the 11th. But we also hear of a sighting that could have potentially happened on the morning later, much later in the morning of the 12th. Missing from Katitis, Washington, he was 11 years old at the time. He would currently be 25 years old. Obviously, he goes by the nickname Cody. Uh, there is another Richard that we're going to be talking about a lot in this case. That would be his father, Richard Haynes Sr. But anytime I'm talking about this young man, we're going to refer to him as Cody for the rest of the video. Uh, at the time he went missing, he was five feet tall and weighed 90 pounds. Uh, obviously, if he is out there alive now to be found, he's 25 years old. I'm sure he's quite a bit taller and weighs uh, possibly up to double that. 
For the circumstances of his disappearance, once again, they have the date of last contact, September 12th, 2004. Uh, Richard is shown age progressed to 15 years. He was last seen at home on September 12th, 2004. Richard has a round birthmark on his right inner thigh. He may go by the nickname Cody. Uh, here is an image of the age progression to 15 years. And there was another one that was done showing age progressed to approximately 18 years. So get a good look at that also. For physical description, hair color brown and his eye color is listed here as green. I've seen some other posters where they talk about it being blue. I heard an interview with his mother. She has been insisting, no, they were green, they were green. So you might see some variation if you look into information on this. Uh, in terms of physical features, we have the birthmark on his right inner thigh and that is all that is noted. And for clothing, uh, a red hat, black and green camouflage bag, and a red or gray coat. Now we're gonna hear some interesting things. The bag actually isn't missing from what I understand, so I'm kind of surprised to even see that mentioned here. Uh, for the image and documents, they just have the uh, photo and the 2H progressions that I mentioned. And of course, I have contact information in the description box below. So this is the aerial view of where Cody lived, his neighborhood. And in most news stories, they describe it as in the 100 block of Main Street. And that's what I have highlighted here. Uh, I did find some other articles that um, pretty much pinpoint uh, where he lived. Uh, one of them says that it was adjoined to this Sure, sure Shot Guns and Pawn store. Um, I believe what we're actually looking at, we know that it's a two-story building, first of all. And if you look at this street, there's not a lot for two-story buildings on this block. Uh, there's one over on this side that I thought possibly could have been uh, where his family was living, but I did find some better information and it is actually back here, I believe, uh, this two story back here. And his family is renting, this is divvied up as apartments and they're renting a unit on the second story. Let's go ahead and continue over at the Charlie Project and get some more details on this case and a bunch of photos of Cody here. Uh, Megan always does just a, such a wonderful job pulling together all these photos. I really appreciate her work on this. Cody disappeared from his family's home between 4 and 5 p.m. on September 12th, 2004. Now, that is what I understand as kind of the official story that was reported by his father and the woman that was living with his father. They weren't actually married at the time, but they do get married pretty quickly after he goes missing. Do they have a reason for doing that? We're gonna to touch on that as we continue as well. Um, but there's, there's some dispute that seemingly happens at the house, at least according to what the investigators learn as they start pressing on with this case. So uh, he had refused to wash the dishes and Harding punished him by making him sit at the kitchen table for four hours before sending him to his bedroom at about midnight the previous day. Uh, First of all, I got to tell you, when I was 11, if you were going to try to get me to sit like at the kitchen table for that amount of time, I don't even think it would have physically been possible. I just, I don't, I don't know what kind of conditions these children must have been in uh, for them to even endure a punishment of that nature, let alone what happens after that. Let's go ahead and and continue here. Harding told Cody's sisters not to go near his room and told Cody not to leave the room for any reason. Evidently, no one checked on him for close to 18 hours afterwards. Uh, Cody apparently slipped out unnoticed during this time and arranged his stuffed animals on the bed to make it look like he was asleep. He took a black and green camouflage pattern bag of clothing with him, but it was later found in a shed near his house. Investigators believe Cody may have hidden the bag there and planned to return for it later. His bicycle was also found in the shed. Um, just kind of weird to me. I'm not sure what investigators would necessarily believe that. Uh, you know, a young man is thinking about running away, plans enough to actually pack his bag, but then he's going to hide the bag in the shed that is on his family's property. Doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. Admittedly, this is an 11 year old. And, you know, obviously when we're that age, we probably don't put together the best of plans, but there's something about this that just doesn't feel quite right to me. And I could probably say that just about with every detail that we cover as we go through this case. 
Um, there were a few possible sightings of Cody in the local area shortly after his disappearance. A neighbor may have seen him the morning he disappeared, and someone believes they saw him eating potato chips at Johnny's Serve You later that day. Neither sighting has been confirmed. Uh, let's just jump back to the map here because I just want to point out something else that doesn't feel right, uh, even about that sighting. Uh, so if we're looking here, and this is the two-story apartment building that we referred to, uh, Johnny's Market, it, I believe this is the location they're talking about when they say Johnny's Serve You. Um, it's literally right across the street. And once again, if we're considering an 11-year-old's version of running away, could it be that you know he stuffed a bunch of animals, stuffed animals under the, under the uh, blanket and then ran away to the market across the street and was there for a matter of hours before, you know, trying to return home or figuring he was going to return home, possibly. But if this is someone that's really putting a plan together to get away from this house, are you really going to just hang out at the market right across from where you live on top of leaving your backpack in the shed out back of this place? Um, just, just a lot of problems with the, the story here. Authorities believed at first that Cody had run away from home because he was unhappy at the way he was disciplined and that he might try to travel to his mother who lives in Florida. Now, I've been hearing conflicting information on where she was living. I don't know if it was Florida or Colorado or if she is from Colorado and she eventually moved to Florida, but that state seems to flip around with the different versions of this story. Cody did not arrive in Florida, and his mother has been eliminated as a suspect in his disappearance. Uh, let me just tell you that the mother is a little bit of a controversial figure in all this, but it is important to note that she's been eliminated as a suspect. She is pretty active in terms of showing up whenever, uh, at least for a period of years, I'm not sure if she still currently is, but whenever they were holding vigils in the area, she was there. Uh, there's a little bit of... I don't know, just kind of some possibly family infighting that seems to be going on between some cousins that are really trying to spearhead the effort to find Cody at this point and the mother. And there's a lot of press that I'm seeing that is stating the mother had the child, had the children taken away from her because she was abusive to them herself and that she actually served some time for that. Now, I heard an interview where the mother was actually on it. She says she has never been in jail. She has never been on parole. She doesn't know where any of those stories are coming from. But I can tell you, I saw in at least two or three different news sources that are pretty reputable that they were reporting that information. I don't know if they did fact checking or if just one of them reported that and the other two copied off of it. But a um, little bit of controversy there. And of course, we're all wondering, what's the original story here? Why did the mother... Uh, not realize what was going on with these kids. Why did the father, I believe the father actually had full custody. Even with the interview that the mother gave, we really don't get the details to understand that. The short of her story is somehow um, she had an arranged visitation where Cody's father came, picked up Cody and his sisters. Uh, there's four girls that are living in that two bedroom apartment at this time with Cody. Uh, and then basically fled the state. And then she was served with paperwork saying that, you know, he had basically gotten custody of all these kids, even though she states some of those children are not his. So I don't know. There's a lot of weirdness to the story. When the interviewer was asking her for any type of proof or paperwork, it seems like she has absolutely nothing. So I think we really have to take her information with a big grain of salt. Um, but I did want to share it with you guys because you're probably going to bump into it if you look into this case uh, any farther. A week after Cody vanished, his sisters were removed from their father's home and placed into foster care. The removal order alleged abuse, neglect, and lack of supervision in the household and was based mainly on the fact that Cody had been made to stay in his room for 18 hours without being allowed to eat, drink, or use the toilet and without being checked on by an adult. Harding stated that he was a rebellious and deceitful child and needed discipline. Richard and Harding, who married sometime after September 2004, have hired lawyers and will not cooperate with investigators about Cody's disappearance. The rest of his family has cooperated fully with police. Before the Haynes children were taken from their home, Richard refused to allow police 
to question them. Just looking at kind of this summary at Charlie Project on here, we've got all kinds of stuff that's going really, really bad in this situation. Uh, this story that Cody had been disciplined, they forced him to sit at a kitchen table for four hours, then told him to go to his room and left him in there for 18 hours. No food, no bathroom breaks, no one checking on him. It really seems like something bad has happened here. Uh, the other interesting thing about the layout, this is only a two bedroom apartment. The four girls plus the, um, the girlfriend were all staying in one room and Cody was basically sharing a room with his father, but the room that they were in didn't have a door. So to keep the kids from going into that room, there was a chair put up uh, and actually one of the sisters, I believe she says it was more than one, that there was kind of this little wall that was built in the hallway with a sign on it saying that Cody was in trouble and no one was to go talk to him. Uh, so we have a lot of strangeness. Uh, the interviewer of this piece, let me just mention what uh, podcast it was real quick. Um, Bring them home now. Uh, she actually asked Samantha, who is one of the daughters that was in this situation, uh, was this normal? Had you guys seen this before when Cody was in trouble that they would set up a barricade and stop you from going into his room and leave a note on there? She said, no, it had never happened before at all. Let's continue with, uh, this is actually something I had to go to the Wayback Machine to get. This is from what was formerly known as Court TV and their crime library. Uh, I don't have a date on it, but it seems like it's around the start of the investigation. And I wanted to share these quotes with you from the Katitis Police Department chief. We have no information to lead us to believe this is anything other than a voluntary runaway, said Katitis Police Department chief Steve Dunnigan. The Amber Alert was not activated because he was not abducted. Dunnigan went on to express that they had no suspect information or a vehicle description which are needed to place such an alert. A search was initiated by local authorities, volunteers, and the Katitis County Search and Rescue Team with the use of a U.S. Army helicopter. Posters were circulated and dogs were brought in. Cody's scent was picked up in an area where he usually played, but he was not found. Family members, neighbors, friends, and acquaintances were questioned. Quote, at this point, our whole area has been thoroughly searched, said Dunnigan. We are comfortable. He is not within the general area. We have no idea where he is. We have exhausted our leads. We are committed to finding this child. We are in it to find him. Continuing with another article from the Wayback Machine, but this is re referring to an ABC News article dated November 27th, 2004. Family refuses to help in search for boy. So if things already didn't seem troublesome enough in terms of his father and his father's girlfriend and how they're responding to the investigation, we're going to get a little more detail here. People here have come together to try to find an 11-year-old boy missing since September with two important exceptions, his father and the father's live-in girlfriend. Quote, their behavior is definitely curious, Katitis Police Chief Steve Dunnigan told the Spokesman Review. Dunnigan, who leads a two-member force in this central Washington town of about 1,100, said police, quote, don't have squat in the search for Cody. Um, only two people working in this area. Obviously, this is not a very populated area, so it makes sense that they wouldn't have a huge police force. But this is one of those cases where... It makes me wish that there was some mechanism for specific types of cases to roll up to experts of, of some level. These are, uh, you know, two people working in this local police department that probably have not come up against a case like this before. There's a very good chance this might be their first case where there might be some foul play involved. I'm sure they had uh, missing children called in and missing persons reports and filed all that. But in terms of it actually having the potential for being um, something much deeper than that, I don't know how many of those cases, what are, what are the odds that the two guys in the local police department have worked a serious case like that? So... Uh, it's a little bit frustrating. I really wish there was some better mechanism for this where I don't know if it would be like a state department or it's just something at a higher level that said, you know what, when you have this kind of case, our experts come in and they work on this. Now, there is collaboration that does happen much later, but it does seem like initially for some reason the local police are trying to handle this on their own. And I don't know that it was the best call to make, but... 
Let's go ahead and continue. Uh, about 2.30 a.m., Mr. Haynes told us he left the home to go looking for car parts, the chief said. So this is part of this weird story. Uh, and by the way, I don't have a very solid understanding of was the father at home at the time that Cody was being disciplined by the girlfriend. I don't know what time the father gets home that day. I haven't really been able to find that. But at some point, obviously, Cody is supposedly sent to his room around midnight. And I do believe we have one of the sisters that says that they saw him at that time. Um, but after midnight at around 2.30, we now have the father doing something very, very strange, leaving the home to go looking for car parts. Uh, the 43-year-old Haynes is a tow truck operator in Ellensburg who is restoring a 1954 Kaiser, the newspaper said. In preliminary discussions, the chief said Haynes told investigators that he drove hundreds of miles before returning home about 4 p.m. Sunday. He reported the boy missing two hours after that. A lot of questions for me just looking at that one piece of information. One, where are you going at 2.30 in the morning where you're really going to try to find car parts unless you're going to try to steal them? Like, is he driving to uh, like pick your part auto yards and trying to sneak on when no one's there and steal these parts or something? I just, I don't understand that at all. But even if you are doing that, why are you driving? I've seen in another article, it's estimated to be 250 miles and if we break that down, if we say, okay, 250 miles and he's going 50 miles per hour, obviously that's five hours of driving. Supposedly his car breaks down at some point, he needs a friend to come out, repair the car, and then he eventually goes home. I have no idea how long that repair took. I have no time frames on that, but let's estimate that even at another four, let's say five hours just to round it out and make it simple. We have somewhere between four and seven additional hours that this man is unaccounted for in that time frame, at least with the with the information that's available publicly. So very strange with all that. Um, but then we also have the fact that he gets home at four, they figure out Cody is missing, and then it takes them two more hours. And from what I've seen from other places, it doesn't actually get called in until some time around, I think it's 637 if I remember correctly. So it's more like two and a half hours. Did anyone see Cody? at four, and I know the Charlie Project page talked about the fact that he went missing at some point from between four and five. I have not seen any conclusive information about, uh, you know, the father saying, I got home, I saw Cody, he was still in the room at four, uh, I lectured him for a little bit, left, and then we noticed an hour later that he was missing or two hours later that he was missing. We don't have anything like that going on with this case. And it's strange because I know several of you are probably saying, well, John, the, the father isn't talking, so how would we know that? He actually did talk up to a certain point. That's where we're getting at least these pieces of information from. I'm pretty sure something as critical as that last time that they actually saw him should be reflected in these articles, and I'm just not finding it. So Haynes told the Spokesman Review he would not discuss his son's disappearance without his attorney present. Quote, I'm not interested in talking about it. I'm not talking without my attorney present. No way, he said. Asked if it was possible that his son was dead, Haynes said, oh no, not a chance. He's not dead. He's not dead. Now, not that I'm trying to support, it's, it's weird because right from the get-go when you look into this story, you hear this narrative that makes it look like something very bad happened to Cody, his st like soon-to-be stepmother, the live-in girlfriend seems certainly, certainly to be a part of it. The father seems like he's probably a part of it as well. But then I see quotes like this where, you know, we have a newspaper that's reaching out to him. We have the police chief that's reaching out to him. He's not saying that he won't talk, that he won't do further uh, interviews with them. He's simply saying that he's going to have his attorney present if he does that. Now, I know a lot of people are going to say, well, he would just show up with his attorney. And as soon as they started talking, the attorney would say, don't answer that, don't answer that, don't answer that. It's very possible. But here we have the spokesman review saying that they are not really trying to engage him once he says that. We also have the police chief basically saying, we can't talk to him because he told us he won't talk without the attorney present. I don't know that there is absolutely no value in just at least trying. Even if, that, if that's the conditions he's putting around it, just give it a shot. Uh, I'm definitely not seeing that in this case. And it's just another another thing that 
I don't know. It's uh, it's kind of nagging at me in terms of how some things have happened with this case. Uh, moving on to spokesman.com. Uh, Katitis Police Chief Steve Dunnigan says he fears the worst, but hasn't asked for outside law enforcement help. Why? Why? I don't get it. And this is an article from November 2004. So we're already talking a few months after the fact here. Uh, I think they already know this case isn't really going as strongly as they want it to. I think they know they have at least enough to be reasonably suspicious about the details that they do know about, but they're not asking for outside help. It's a small town, the chief said. We don't have this kind of thing happen here ever. I am so disappointed by that statement. It's it, There's a level, it feels like it's just ignorant. There's just this level of almost like turning my head the other way. No, we don't have this type of stuff happen here ever. Well, you actually did have it happen there. And it, it, he might be talking about the fact of what their suspicions are, that there's something much worse going on here. Well, if those types of things really don't happen there, then bring in outside law enforcement so they can confirm your analysis and then you can feel better about it. Because at this point, you've got a two-man department and it feels like this thing could be handled differently and maybe we could have got a better result here. But instead, this comment just, it really, really lets me down. We don't have this kind of thing happen here ever. Well, there's about 40 news articles that uh, do not agree with that statement at all. The chief doesn't think at this point that a stranger abducted the boy. The boy's natural mother, who has served prison time in Florida for child abuse and can't legally have contact with Cody, has been eliminated as a suspect, Dunnigan said. Now, I've already touched on it, but I just wanted to give you one of the quotes um, that is floating around this. Obviously, she's saying that uh, she has never been in prison. Uh, I'm also telling you guys, I don't know if it's Florida or Colorado because the state seems to change. Maybe it's just that she's moved. Uh, and she didn't really speak about any aspect as to uh, why the children, why she didn't have the ability to uh, still have custody of the children outside of saying that she couldn't take on a legal battle. She just doesn't have the resources to take on a legal battle. But uh, just keep in mind, obviously, she's been eliminated as a suspect. And from what I understand, the girls uh, are, some of the girls are in contact with her. Uh, during that interview on the podcast I listened to, uh, one of the daughters is actually with her and being interviewed with her. Uh, and she says some very sweet things just about her reconnecting with her mother and about how they enjoy each other now. But Dunnigan, who says he knows almost every kid in town, said he knew four girls lived in Haynes's home, but the chief had no idea there was also a young boy who lived there. He was very sheltered, very controlled, very structured, the chief said of the boy. Harding, 39, that's the live-in girlfriend, is a former child protective services worker. Let me just stop and give that a moment to, to sink in. She worked for CPS for the state of Washington, but was fired five years before in February 2001 and denied unemployment benefits court records show. Harding was fired for misconduct, said DSHS spokeswoman Kathy Spears. Uh, DSHS is the Department of Social and Health Services. The ex-CPS worker and Haynes were the focus of a welfare fraud investigation when Cody was reported missing, the police chief and state officials confirmed. So we've got a lot going on. Could it be that this is an additional stressor to the situation that is pushing either Harding and or Haynes uh, to act out and to kind of escalate the abuse of their children. So it appears uh, a reporter went up and tried to knock on the door. Harding didn't answer the door at the Katitis apartment. A handwritten note addressed to Cody was folded over and taped to a back door. I've seen a few references to this handwritten note, and it just screams out to me that someone is really trying to push a strange narrative that Cody ran away, but they're not really concerned about it because they're not really helping with the searches, but they're pretty confident he's going to come home because he left his bag out in the shed and his bike was out in the shed. So if he comes home, maybe he's not going to come all the way inside, but they're going to leave him a note on the door. It's bizarre. It just, it doesn't really make a lot of logical sense. I'm just trying to tell you guys how it seems to fit in with this 
strange narrative of a boy who runs away and comes home to visit, but doesn't really come inside, just grab his stuff from outside. Not making a lot of sense to me. The chief said the boy in Harding, who Haynes initially described only as his children's caregiver, had a heated argument after a Saturday dinner on September 11th. The boy reportedly refused a request to put leftovers away and do the dishes. As discipline, Cody was ordered to sit in the kitchen until almost midnight when he was sent to a second floor bedroom without a door, which he shared with his dad, the chief said. His four sisters sleeping in another bedroom at the other end of the apartment were told to stay away from their brother's room. Now, it seems like some of the articles um, don't, some of the articles seem very strong about this apartment was on the second floor. And that's the impression I got from the interview I listened to as well. Uh, Some of these articles are writing it like there's like it's a two story, it is a two story, but like the apartment has two stories within it. That's not my understanding from what I'm getting from most of the other sources. So let me just point that out. Um, And I think that makes it stranger because you're talking about a situation where there wasn't, I don't believe there was like a lot of living space downstairs. And then you had this, um, you know, these interior stairs that would take you upstairs and you might have people downstairs that don't know what's really going on upstairs. I believe it is quite a bit more confined than that. The way his sister describes it on the podcast is, uh, there's this hallway. Yes. The girls are in a room at one end of the hallway. There is the door or the doorway leading to Cody's room. And then just past that is actually the door to get you outside, at least the main entry to the house. So in one way, it could support the thought that if he did sneak out, he would have relatively easy access to the front door and be able to get out uh, through that. But why would the front door be on the second story? Doesn't really make sense unless the whole apartment was on the second story, which is kind of what I'm assuming. Another big thing that comes out in that interview, and I really don't know how to feel about this, but Samantha, the um, the other daughter that's being interviewed, she's saying that this whole situation about having to sit at the table did not actually happen to Cody. That actually happened to her. And while she was sitting at the table, Cody was taken into the kitchen and something was happening in the kitchen that she could not see. And it sounded like it was violent and it sounded like really bad things were going on in there. And she specifically mentions there was two people in the kitchen, but she wouldn't say who. Um, I I don't know. I guess obviously if your mind is where mine is with this, we're thinking that there's some possibility that both... Um, his father and the girlfriend were in the kitchen at the same time with Cody and when bad things could have been possibly happening to him. Uh, I don't know how to feel about it because the narrative that is pushed in this story time and time again and seemingly coming from the chief of police is that Cody was the one that was ordered to sit at that table for numerous hours. But now we have his sister saying, no, 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 it never happened that way. It was me. It strikes me that if someone is lying about this situation, it would be really easy for them to swap that story. Obviously, if someone was doing something to Cody, they can't tell the truth of what was happening to Cody. So what do you do instead? You tell the story of what was actually going on with one of the other kids. That way, if they press you for details, it's you don't have to make them up. You're just telling the story of the kid, but you've swapped the name out. So it does strike me that there's a good possibility that what she's saying is accurate, But we also have to consider these are children that went through very traumatic stuff uh, and then were taken away from their homes. And even by how the mother described it, all of them are dealing with very severe emotional issues, um, depression. Uh, There's very, very bad situations that some of these girls are are dealing with on an emotional level. So is there some possibility that this is some type of transposing that's happening or that Samantha's memory might not be very clear about that particular night? She's kind of putting herself into the situation there. I, I think we have to consider it. I don't know how strong of a consideration it is, but... It really uh, calls out to me that she's saying, no, 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 it wasn't Cody. That was me that was actually sitting at the table. Before he stopped talking, Haynes told investigators that his middle of the night, 250 mile trip took him from Katitis to Tapenish to Yakima 
to the notches. He took a wrong turn at the Vernita Bridge and eventually ended up on US Highway 395 that took him to Ritzville and Interstate 90. Haynes drove east, at least to Sprague in Lincoln County, the chief said. At some point, he turned around and returned west before his 1984 Dodge minivan broke an axle at the Sprague rest stop. He called a friend who drove to the rest stop and helped him make the repairs, then returned to the Katitis home about 4 p.m. So it's really strange to me, um, and maybe this is just the way that the police chief is relaying the information, but we're not hearing that Haynes went to John's auto salvage in this town and then couldn't find what he was looking for. So he went to the auto parts yard over in this part of the town. There doesn't seem to be a very good sense of rhyme or reason about where he's going. And we're hearing about these locations just in terms of kind of the town names instead of, you know, well, I found one part over here. I was looking for this other part. So I went over here. They didn't have it. I went over here. This, and I, like I'm saying, we're not getting it from his mouth. So I don't know. Those details might have actually been relayed to the chief. He might be holding off on that because he's trying to use that uh, in terms of uh, corroboration. If someone comes up and they're like, no, I saw him and I know he was in that town, but he was actually at this place. So uh, it's just very strange to me. And it's still, it's just bizarre. 250 miles driving around in the middle of the night. What, what are you doing that for? And the strange thing is he works as a tow truck driver. He almost has kind of the perfect alibi, um, I guess, unless you could, I, I guess, maybe not. Maybe you couldn't exactly use that because uh, you would have people you were interacting with. You probably have some type of dispatch or call center that you're working with and they could verify if you were working or not. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. This is just such a bizarre aspect of this case. I really haven't quite heard of anything this nutty since uh, the Elisa, uh, Alyssa Turney case uh, in terms of where someone is going and all these distances that they're, that they're traveling. I asked him, Haynes, if it was possible Cody stowed away in the van and then got out. And he said it was possible, the chief said. Kind of an interesting line of questioning um, and kind of an interesting thought. Uh, and that's something I think we should touch on just in terms of theories. I don't know how strong of a theory it is, but if Cody did actually get away, um, could something have happened to him? Could he have gone someplace where we just haven't figured it out and someone has been taking care of him? Keep in mind at this point, he's 25 years old. He doesn't really have to be held accountable to his parents anymore and he still hasn't got any word back. He's got family members that are working real hard trying to figure out what happened here. You know, he could kick up a Facebook account and reach out to them and let them know, hey, I'm fine and that's not happening. So I don't know how strong it is, but I do think just to touch on the possible theories here, uh, we do have to consider that he did actually run away and was able to make it work in some way. Um, and maybe this was part of it. Maybe he did hide in the minivan until his father was at a stop and then took off from there. But once again, doesn't really seem to support this whole thought that he left his bag behind and his bike so that he could all go back and get it later. Chief Dunnigan returned to the family home on September 17th hoping to ask the boy's four sisters about what they had seen the night of the disappearance. Harding answered the door and told the police chief he couldn't question the girls. In front of them, she told the chief, I'm not going to lose my freedom for anything, according to the dependency petition filed by CPS workers. When told she wasn't the guardian or parent of the children, Harding instructed Haynes to deny the request and he followed her instructions, the dependency petition said. So it's almost like her experience in terms of working with CPS uh, is now being used to protect this situation. Really bothers me that someone that would do that type of work and go into that line of work would now be using what they know about it to protect uh, possibly something severely inappropriate going on here. The police chief made a referral to CPS saying his initial investigation uncovered evidence of child abuse, inappropriate discipline in the home. The four girls were removed from the home on September 21st. 
Haynes and Harding didn't show up for a community-wide search September 15th when volunteers went door to door to 430 homes in the community of 1,135, passing out flyers with information about the missing boy. His family did provide a pillowcase for the search four days after he disappeared, but tracking dogs couldn't find a scent trail, the chief said. Now, another interesting thing from the podcast is uh, the person that was working with the tracking dogs says they did not actually get a pillowcase. They tried to get a pillowcase because it's one of the best pieces that you can get in terms of getting someone sent for the dogs, but the pillowcase, the sheets, everything had been washed and they wound up with a shirt. She believed it was a Bazooka Joe shirt and she wasn't certain that it even had a solid scent of Cody or was something that he would have uh, had recently. Um, but that's what they used for uh, the dogs on that particular search. The dad and his girlfriend also didn't attend a candlelight vigil organized by the community for the missing boy, Dunnigan said. And it's just, it really, if they're not involved in this, this is the absolute worst thing that you can do because they're pulling so much focus in terms of the media and how people talk and review this case that the true clues, if there, if there are other clues to be looked at, they're just completely gone to the wayside because the popular version of this story is now, hey, do you know about that little boy and the father and live-in girlfriend that aren't really trying to find him? And, oh, what do you think happened there? Oh, well, there's this other thing. Father went driving out in the middle of the night, went 250 miles, was gone for 14 to 17 hours. It's just... It's terrible because it absolutely pulls the focus. It gets everyone's brain going a certain direction. It gets our focus going a very specific direction. Let me just put out there, uh, if anyone wants to come on this that is part of the family, that wants to come on this channel, help clear any of this up, share information with us that we can review, hopefully verify, and then share with others, please reach out to me. You can email me at john at lordandarts.com. At dailyrecordnews.com, we have an article from December 3rd, 2004, and we're going to get some insight from Cody's grandmother. Audrey Haynes keeps her porch light on in case her missing grandson comes home one day. She first met the child face-to-face -face when he was five or six after his family moved to the Katitis Valley from Colorado. Audrey Haynes and Cody share a closeness of a grandmother and grandson. His artwork hangs on her walls. Their birthdays are a day apart and celebrated together. The last time Haynes saw her step-grandson was on Labor Day weekend, mere days before his disappearance. Now, I don't know if you guys saw my eyes kind of bug out of my head, but I did not catch that before. Step-grandson. So I'm assuming that she married uh, Cody's biological grandfather. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Haynes said she is living each day on the edge of fear and emotions that have ground her down into despair since Cody was reported as a runaway. It's hard to believe these things happen, she said, sobbing. It's like living in a dream world. My emotions are fear and emptiness. I cry every day, but I have to keep going. It's all I've got. I hope he'll ring the doorbell one day and be there on the porch. Me and grandpa leave the light on for him. Haynes describes Cody as a normal, rambunctious little boy who is typical. He's an active boy, she said. To me, he is how little boys are supposed to be. There is nothing mean or spiteful about him. Uh, sounds quite a bit different than the comment that the uh, live-in girlfriend was saying about him. Haynes said Cody is artistic and creative with a mechanical mind. He is a boy who likes to build things and enter his creations in the fair. Cody loves to read. He is a happy kid who likes to chase bugs. But Cody also needs to know his boundaries, she said. You had to talk to Cody and really explain things to him about consequences. He needed guidance and told right from wrong. But once he knew the rules, he would abide by them. He knew what was expected of him. Cody also had limited contact with the outside world. He was homeschooled, was not allowed to use a computer, and had no close friends. Now, a part of the story I haven't touched on yet is CPS actually had at least two prior complaints about this household. One of them, I believe, came from a school principal. At that time, when the second complaint happened, uh, I believe all the kids were taken out of the public schooling system and then homeschooled. For some reason, those complaints 
didn't seem to find any evidence of the abuse going on. And some of the stuff that was being talked about was like if the kids were uh, in trouble, they would be put outside uh, with no jacket, no shoes, like out in the freezing cold and would have to stay out there for a period of time. Uh, and of course, you know, we're hearing about the potential for much much worse things that could be going on in the house outside of that. But apparently for those first two complaints, they just didn't find enough to actually act on them. Um, could that be part of the reason why this case maybe isn't an easy one to solve? It's definitely something that's ringing through my mind. You know, we've got, um, we've got some potential fallout if it would be proven that Cody was indeed in danger and that department did not act accordingly or wasn't able to kind of do their job the right way. There might be some legal fallout from that. There could be a very, very large settlement that would come out of that. Uh, so it's just one of the things that kind of nags at me about this whole story is there might be some potential for why people would not necessarily want to see this case solved if it is the worst case that we're, that we're feeling it could be. Uh, which would be terrible. It'd be just another horrible aspect to a very, very tough situation. He's a smart kid, but not streetwise, she said. I suppose if he were upset enough, he might try to get a ride from someone, but I wouldn't term him as overly brave, though. I never thought of him as a daredevil. And those comments are interesting to me just because they don't support, at least from my point of view, a, a young man that might actually try pulling off running away and actually be able to do it and stay away for this period of time. Um, and they're also not necessarily nudging me towards at least her noticing that he was in an abusive situation. So I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of, um, it's an interesting piece to a puzzle that has a lot of pieces that don't seem to fit together. February 15th, 2005, this is back at spokesman.com. Police investigators from three agencies acting on information developed by the FBI served a search warrant Monday at the rental home of an 11-year-old boy who's been missing for five months. The search warrant was based on allegations that Cody Haynes was beaten severely inside his father's second floor rental apartment. Details provided by one of the missing boy's sisters, now in state custody, provided enough probable cause for investigators to get a judge to sign the search warrant, according to sources familiar with the investigation. So it sounds like things are finally moving in the direction where we think that they're going to move. Uh, and they're able to convince a judge that they've got enough here for probable cause for them to go ahead and execute these search warrants. Should be a good thing, right? Uh, investigators who entered the apartment on Valentine's Day were looking for traces of blood, particularly in the kitchen. What they initially found, sources said, was that the kitchen flooring had been replaced without the knowledge or consent of the landlord. Another big shake your head moment for me. What the heck is going on? Why are they replacing the kitchen floor and not talking to the landlord about it? It's not their place. So what is going on here? The investigators got a second amended search warrant, allowing them to seize a computer found in the apartment. Dunnigan confirmed investigators had made, quote, a significant discovery inside the apartment, but wouldn't discuss particulars. No trace of the boy has been found. Investigators fear he is a homicide victim. The FBI entered the investigation late last year, assigning the case to an agent who specializes in missing and exploited children. The agent, in a series of interviews, developed a rapport with the young girls taken from the home and placed in foster homes. The girls, apparently fearing possible parental retribution, initially said nothing had happened to their brother on the day he vanished from the family's home. But last week, the oldest girl told the agent her brother had been severely beaten in the home shortly before he disappeared. Uh, and yeah, to hear from them that nothing happened to him also does not support the story that the father and the live-in girlfriend want to put out as well. Obviously, he had to be acting up to the point of them disciplining him because they put him through, according to them, four hours at the table and then up to another 18 hours in the bedroom. Uh, so I think that they would realize the girls probably aren't being honest with us if they're telling us nothing happened. Other detectives used the warrant to impound the father's Chevrolet Suburban. Haynes and Harding were married about six weeks ago in Yakima, not long after they sold the family's van. 
What van do you think we're talking about? That's right, the 250 mile ride van. The van was located about two weeks ago and will be searched along with a camper trailer and this Chevrolet Suburban Dunnigan said. Now, that article comes out and literally the next day, another article comes out, leak in Cody case worries police chief. Uh, apparently the details about one of the daughters talking, I'm assuming that that's what it is. There's not a direct quote in here from the chief uh, outside of the fact that he's trying to protect someone who gave information. Sounds to me like it's one of the daughters. Uh, that has him concerned. He believes that it is someone in the attorney's uh, the attorney general's office that is leaking confidential information to a reporter in this case and potentially risking the case. Why would someone do that? Uh, once again, I don't know if I'm, if I'm thinking about the possibility of, you know, a huge lawsuit hitting uh, CPS or some other service that should have helped this situation. <sighs> It just, it feels like someone does not want this case to go properly. And we never really hear about what was discovered, the significant discovery that they found in the apartment. It just never comes out. So apparently that information is still being kept under wraps and someone has a significant piece of evidence that they're not using to actually try anyone or try to bring this case to a close. September 13th, 2011, we're just Jumping forward years here, uh, family friends hold vigil for missing Katitis boy. While the sun was setting Monday night, community members quietly signed white poster boards dotted with pictures of Richard Cody Haynes. I remember you fondly, wrote Wendy Hinkle. We will never forget you, wrote Susan Kelleher. You remember that day, don't you, honey? Ruth Townley asked her 11-year-old grandson, Jade Townley. I was four, Jade said. Ruth and Jade said they were the last two people to see Cody before he went missing. They lived next door to his family. We were on our way to church that morning, said Ruth, 86. He waved to us. The little boy told Ruth he'd see her soon. Bless his heart, she said. So this is one of the sightings of him uh, that I don't know what to think, but she's going to church. This is on Sunday morning. Uh, for some reason, she sees Cody and he's just kind of out and about and he's right outside his place and he says that uh, he'll be seeing her soon. Does that sound like a kid that has, you know, just endured 22 hours of discipline and is trying to run away? I don't believe that Ruth is lying. I think what happens in some of these cases is people are trying to be helpful and they're saying, don't you remember? Yeah, we saw Cody, right? And they're, a, they're taking a memory that is from a different time period and they're plopping it on that specific day. I have no idea when she recalled this. These quotes are happening in 2011. So it's been a number of years since this actually happened. Um, and on top of that, I don't think we know how old, oh, Ruth is 86 at this point. So could there possibly be some memory recall issues that are muddling this up? Maybe. And I do think it's important to point out that of these sightings that supposedly happened, someone saw him eating chips at the local store. This is one of the sightings, a neighbor that saw him on their way to church. Nothing's been confirmed in terms of these sightings. We have people that say that they saw him. Uh, and if it's just one of those things. If, if you lived there for a period of years and you had that happen a few times, um, would it be that hard to believe that you're just getting the day wrong? I know I wouldn't trust my memory uh, any more than that. I, I certainly make mistakes. Let's continue here. Uh, There's not a day that goes by that I don't cry and pray, Ruth said. It's just not fair. Every morning I get up and I think about Cody. Somewhere, somehow, there's got to be an answer. 50 community members, including family, friends, and former teachers of Cody, attended Monday's vigil. And from here, the press kind of starts going into just vigil mode, you know, every year when they're doing it. And this is part of why it's important to do vigils, by the way. Um, the press is covering it. We see another article here from Daily Record News on September 13th, 2012. And we start noticing another trend that happens with vigils. A group of about 45 people released purple and blue balloons into the sky. This was part of a yearly vigil held for Cody. Uh, it is the only unsolved missing child case in Katitis County. 
Cody's mother, Lisa Doney, is at this event, and she gives us an update in terms of Cody's father. Uh, Richard Haynes lives in Copolis Beach, Doney said, and he's working on a movie called Devil in the Woods, a horror film. I don't know, guys. I tried to look up more on the movie. I couldn't find anything. And it notes a $5,000 reward is offered for information that leads to solving Cody's case. We also hear, and I don't know if this is a shift that has happened with the case, if it's been moved to the sheriff's department, but now all of a sudden, Under Sheriff Clay Myers is commenting on this case, and he kind of becomes the face of the case. Um, the former police chief, I went looking on the website. He doesn't work in that same role there anymore. There's a new police chief there now, but I haven't seen his name pop up in relation to this case at all. So it kind of seems like the sheriff's office has taken it on. Under Sheriff Clay Myers said the sheriff's office recently had a meeting with the FBI and other law enforcement agencies involved in Cody's case. He said the sheriff's office is in the process of doing a complete review of the case, which it does every year. I just want to reassure the family and the friends and others who are concerned this case is not forgotten and this case has not been put away, Myers said. And over at NBCRightNow.com from November 25th, 2012, Cody Haynes would be 19 years old. His picture adorns the walls of his mother's home. I expect to hear some news, just none of it positive, said Cody's mother, Lisa Doney. His older sister, Samantha Dobbs, said Cody was sent to his bedroom by their stepmother for bad behavior, and that was the last time she saw him. Dobbs said there was a lot of physical abuse in that household, and the family doesn't think he made it out of that room. Now, eight years later, Cody's family is formally seeking a death certificate. Uh, it's kind of interesting because according to the search information and the strange flooring job that's going on in the kitchen, and at least some of what seems like it's leaked information from one of the children in the house, it seems like Cody was actually attacked in the kitchen. But what Samantha's saying here feels a little bit different. She's saying that she, it sounds like she's saying she witnesses Cody actually going to his room. And that could mean that any violence could have happened in the room and not necessarily in the kitchen. So uh, I don't know. The family wants others to learn from Cody's case, especially children who are victims of domestic violence. Go to a teacher and persist, said Dobbs. I was scared. I didn't talk to nobody. But if you go to a teacher or like a grandparent, someone that's not in the home, do it. Cody's family said even though a piece of paper will declare him officially dead, they never stop holding vigils to get his face out there. And I don't know what happens with that part of the story either. There's a few mentions of it, and then it just kind of disappears. Uh, I don't think that he was declared dead because I'm pretty sure that that would kick off uh, another round of news stories on this. And, you know, they're trying to get this done back in uh, 2012. We're now looking at six years later, um, so I don't know if that actually comes to fruition. A little bit of a bright spot in this story, I just want to mention Gordon Trucking, Inc. They work with Washington State Patrol and an organization called iMagic through their Homeward Bound pro program. The goal of Homeward Bound is to increase awareness on missing children and hopefully lead to the return of missing children. According to GTI's website, its fleet currently travels across the country with large pictures of 23 missing children displayed on 86 trailers. Since the program's launched in 2006, six children have been found. I know several of you brain scratchers are probably noticing Chiron Horman's picture here. He is featured on this program as well as Cody Haynes uh, and a bunch of other kids. So I just wanted to call that out. I think it's really awesome that a company is helping in that way. Uh, we move on to more vigils, 2016. Every year that passes, the crowd at the annual Cody Haynes vigil gets a little smaller. On Saturday, there were only around 15 people. We'll probably go home and cry our eyes out tonight because I just feel like everybody's forgotten about him, said Desiree Bauer, a distant cousin of the missing boy. Desiree thinks that since the case has gone cold and nobody has shared any new information, that people are getting sick of hearing about it. Uh, Desiree, if you happen to see this, no. No one's getting sick of hearing about this. This is a very important case that needs to be discussed. There's a lot that people can learn uh, from understanding this story better. And of course, we want to help too by raising exposure to all this. 
His case is getting colder and colder and everyone's forgetting about him, she said. Desiree and her sister Jamie have not given up hope and have continued to organize searches and hire private investigators, but there have been a few bumps on the road. An earlier search party with search dogs found that the dogs weren't properly trained to sniff out human remains. A private investigator was also found to not have a license. Um, I do bump into that quite a bit. If you guys are ever hiring private investigators, vet them, look into their backstory, check their license, uh, look for referrals, try to talk to other people about their experience. It's really, really important. We've kind of learned the hard way. You really have to look into people that are saying they're helping, Desiree said. Jamie said the group will have to continue asking for tips from anyone who knows anything that might help. All they can really do, she said, is give any information to law enforcement and hope that it connects with something so they can bring Cody home. I want Cody to be found and I want him to have the justice that he deserves, Desiree said. Everyone knows that Cody didn't run away. Cody's not missing. He was hidden. Uh, there is a Facebook page that they've put together. It's uh, the one that has the post that we started this video with, facebook.com forward slash justice for the letter R, Cody Haynes. And of course, I'll have a link to that in the description box below. On top of that, there is a change.org petition that has been started by them as well. As you can see, I've already signed it. I hope you guys will consider doing the same. There's a link to that. You can join this. They're trying to get it up to 10,000, currently at 3,700. And 72. Now we get to something that's a little bit of a bummer in this whole case. I can see that there's a GoFundMe that was started um, by Jamie, who's one of those cousins, and they raised some money, uh, but it is now closed out. You can't uh, donate to this one anymore. There is another GoFundMe that has been started. It is active, but it's not making money. It's uh, 75 bucks has been raised by two people in 74 months. And this one is being run by his mother. And this is where we get into some things that are really just not helping this case in particular. Um, the cousins have raised some money, but they're also saying over at Web Sleuths that the mother might have not done the right thing with some of the funds from one of those rounds of fundraising. Uh, let's go ahead and jump to an article at Web Sleuths, try to get some more information and also a better understanding of that aspect. Uh, so we have a user here that's talking about, and I saw reference to this too, there was a previous Facebook page that was set up by a family member, also for Cody. A, wom a woman named Christian posts to the page every so often, and then in the About Me portion of the Facebook page, it states, Cody Haynes ran away September 12th, 2004. He's been gone for over seven years. He ran away because we were abused in the home. What was put into the papers of what happened that night are wrong. The father didn't go out at 2.30 a.m. to look for car parts. He went out and drove around to cool down. Also, later that day, he went looking for car parts. A few weeks later, someone saw him and yelled his name and he started to run. Then someone said they saw him in the Seattle area. Again, they called his name and he ran. So he's still alive, just very afraid, but we need to let him know that he will be safe when he comes home. Also, DSHS said they had him, but he ran away from the foster system. They said this in court and is very upsetting, I know. I don't know what court case she would be talking about where they would say that. I don't know how there could be something documented like that and the other families would not know about it. Uh, but let's see what the cousins, uh, Jamie Owens, is commenting here. The sister that says Cody ran away is the only sister that believes her dad is innocent. She has changed her story from the time Cody went missing. She sticks with whatever her dad says. First, he said he was looking for car parts, but now she said he went to cool off. Cool off from what? I think that's a great question. I think another great question is, uh, she even admits that there's abuse going on in the house. So why are you telling Cody to come home and that he has to know that he's going to be safe? Why? Why would he think that if he really got away from an abusive situation? Now to the issue of money. We raised almost $2,000 for a search team to come. They came and searched. During that time, Cody's biological mother, Lisa, who abused the kids as a child, took it upon herself to spend all the money and not pay the team. We have an unbelievably difficult time raising funds. 
who can blame anyone for not wanting to donate when Cody's own mother ripped off the people searching for her son? So clearly we have some fighting that's going on within the family that is actually trying to work on this. Um, and it, 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 she's absolutely right. Uh, you, you guys know me. I'm looking for GoFundMes when we're talking about cases like this. It's one of the things I'm most proud of in terms of the work that I do on this channel is donating to cases to try to help these people with resources. And after seeing all this, I don't want to donate to this case either. And that breaks my heart. Uh, I, I want to donate exposure. I want to donate my time. I want to get a better understanding. I want to put the offer out for others to come on this platform that we've built and share their information with people about this case. But I don't feel great about sending my funds. And the only open GoFundMe is directly to the person being accused of uh, stealing from the first set of funds. Unfortunately, we don't have further information on the investigation because it seems the department gave up years ago. We give them leads and they just don't follow up. Not sure if it's because the undersheriff is related to people who may be involved, but I definitely think they don't want something getting out. Um, and I got to be honest, that comment is what led my brain down the thought of why would the department actually not want this solved and then I started thinking about, well, I guess there could be potentially some type of legal kickback for, you know, basically making trouble for another department if this does turn out that Cody, um, Cody's life was ended or he was harmed in some way and that CPS didn't do his, its job and route that out or that CPS maybe was being manipulated. Maybe this former employee had enough inroads still there that she was able to make that go away. It just, it does feel like, there's potential for an administrative cover-up that's going on here. Uh, and that really bothers me. They do happen. I know it. I, I've experienced it myself. Administrations are great at protecting themselves. It is their primary focus. Don't, don't fool yourself. So uh, I, I get it. Outside of that, in this Web Sleuths thread, uh, Cody's grandpa also comments in a few places. They don't actually verify his identity, but he doesn't really... Um, he doesn't contribute a whole lot. I think there's three messages he leaves in total, and I think he started two different accounts to do that. Um, but he does note here, Cody not being seen after he was sent to bed is not exactly correct. A neighbor swore in court she saw him coming down the steps on the day he disappeared while his father was gone. The police tend to not believe her, but the judge did. Also, the father and what is now the stepmother do talk to the police, just not to the local police. Once again, I don't know what court they keep talking about with this information, but I believe that neighbor is the woman that we were talking about before. And I just, I don't know if we can, we can really hold and, you know, I guess she would have been about 80 year old, an 80 year old memory um, about a specific day and a, an interaction like that. You know, I, I, I don't know. I know this video is going too long, so I think I'm going to wrap it up there. I gave you guys pretty much the nuts and bolts of this case. I, I know there's some details I wanted to get to, but I just can't quite squeeze them in here. Honestly, I feel like I, I could cover this case for another 30 or 40 minutes. Um, but I wanna give a very big shout out to Bring Them Home Now. If you wanna learn more about this case, it is two hours long, but I really recommend that you give it a listen. There is a lot of information that you can take out of that, try to fit into this puzzle and try to get a better understanding. Uh, I did look for videos on this case also, and I just wanted to point out, I think I ran into the youngest true crime YouTuber I've ever seen. This is Emily Trimble. And I just wanna say, Emily, I think you did an awesome job. She did some really good research and more important than that, some of the stuff that she touched on in terms of the sensitivity for the family and her research and if she got anything wrong, she wants to make sure that you know no one gets upset about it. She worked really hard. She pulled together pages and pages of notes to cover this. Emily, I think you did a really great job and I hope you continue with this because I think you've definitely got a talent for it and we need more people to raise exposure to these cases. Um, I did say I wasn't sure who to give money to in this case. I went looking and I found preventchildabuse.org. They are one of the highest rated charities if over at uh, Charity Navigator. 
Their mission is to prevent the abuse and neglect of our nation's children. I'm going to make a donation on behalf of myself and my amazing Patreon and PayPal supporters to Prevent Child Abuse America, and we're going to donate it in Cody's honor. I figured that was the best way where I can give some money, try to help, try to make a change for some other children that might be facing some really, really terrible situations. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. I can't do this without you guys. And I just want to ask if you have friends in the Washington area in particular, please share this video. Let's keep the exposure raised. Let's try to help these family members that are looking for answers. Where is Cody? Someone out there has some information. If you do, please use the contact info I've left in the description box below. Put it in the hands of people that can act on it. And let's see if we can bring some peace and closure to this situation. It's really one of the toughest cases I've looked into this year, and there are people that live this on a day-to-day -day basis. Thanks, everyone. Take care, and I'll see you back here on Friday with an episode of Brain Scratch.